13 minutes past two. It's BBC Essex on a Wednesday afternoon, and uh, one of the great joys of my job is to read books sometimes. And I'm very pleased to say that not only is it a cracking new book I've got to tell you about, but also it's for somebody who's no stranger to this radio station and indeed to the area as well. Paul Eilert uh, is a journalist and, and has been for many years. He used to work here at BBC Essex, for that matter. Uh, but also... Uh, He's got his debut novel out, which is called Expose. It's the story of a tabloid newspaper, one that may be familiar to you, even though it doesn't exist. It's called The Daily Ear. Uh, It loves its celebrity gossip. It loves to reveal those intimate secrets about the stars. But has the tables turned by an angry young actor. More than that, I won't say. I'll just say a very good afternoon to Paul. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, a terrific read. Great read. Thank and you. Uh, first thing to, to note is that this is very, very pertinent at the moment, isn't it? It couldn't be fresher. No, absolutely. I mean, I started writing the book uh, three years ago um, when we were in the middle of, of the phone hacking scandal had just started and payments to officials and, and lots of other things. All the Newsnight stuff was happening at the time as well. Um, so I was driving to work every morning, listening to BBC Attics, and every day there was another scandal involving the media and the media reporting on itself. Um, but what really struck me was two things. One was on social media. Um, there was no sympathy at all for the press. People were clearly enjoying every second of it, which was quite uh, <laughs> quite interesting. Um, but secondly was that the, the, the editorial staff involved, whether they be reporters or managers, were quite outraged that they were sort of under the spotlight in the way that they put other people under the spotlight over the years um and i just began to think well what if that happened properly what if someone really took the the, the reporting techniques of a sun or a mail or a, or a daily star and actually started using them against the the staff of a newspaper and, and they suddenly found their private lives being exposed for people to, to look at um and that's where the idea came from it's amazing isn't it how we the public are always much more interested about any attack against the press when it's made by a member of celebrity. So, for instance, Hugh Grant or Kate Winslet or whoever it might be uh, that has a point to make, we're more likely to listen to them because they're famous. Absolutely. It's it's interesting. It's a a terrible thing, really, about modern society that we're so obsessed with celebrity that, um, you know, we won't even necessarily engage with the political debate unless there's celebrity involved and, you know, press freedom again. We're much more interested about an attack on a celebrity's privacy than on an ordinary member of the public for some reason. Um, but, But no, it was... And, and I think that sort of came through in the book, that when I was looking for a character to actually be behind this project to expose all the seekers of this newspaper, I knew straight away it had to be a celebrity. If it was an ordinary member of the public, it just wouldn't be so engaging as a, as a read. The book begins with the star reporter from the Daily Ear, who can do no wrong. This is a man who has made a fortune, has a, a, a seemingly fantastic life. He has a, a beautiful young wife, he's got a baby on the way, he's got great stories coming up, but he has skeletons in his cupboard, shall we say, which makes him just as vulnerable as the people that he's reporting on. Um, an interesting way to start, because in an odd way, even though, and as I'm not, not all the way through the book yet, but as reprehensible as this man seems to be, I do have a little empathy for him. Is that the way you've written it? Are we meant to have empathy? I was just no, a mark on me. <laughs> no, no. I just I, I feel a bit scared for him in some way. I, I didn't think it would be um, that interesting a story if it was very black and white, that the newspaper staff were bad and the celebrity actor was good, and, and that was the way it played out. So um, I think all of the characters... Um, have some redeeming quality. You do simple, and actually, I've had some feedback from people who've read the book saying they're quite cross because you know they hate this type of newspaper, but they ended up feeling quite sorry for some of the staff that work there. Mm. So um, I really wanted to make sure that every single character was fully rounded, and that you could see why they did what they did, um, and that you did sympathise with them to some point. Mm. Because I suppose the defence of any any journalist, particularly those that work in an area where they are getting information, you know, what is in the public interest, which of course in itself is a debate, would always argue that, well, this is what their job is, and if people didn't want them to do their job, they wouldn't buy the newspapers. I mean, there's um, there's a theme in the book which, which is exactly that. It, it's really about how, how culpable is the public in this, because obviously, you know, papers wouldn't do kiss-and-tell stories if their readership stopped buying them as a result of doing them mm. so it isn't all focused on the paper there's there's a lot of debate in the public uh, through social media for instance which is covered in the book around what's going on um, and there, there are comments around well hold on a second if you don't like this 
style of journalism, why are you buying this newspaper? Mm. There's an awful lot of talk as well in, in the early part of the book here. There's a, in fact, there's one whole chapter which is just about media reaction. And I love the way you wrote that in a way of a series of either tweets, banner headlines, reaction like that. And we do, te- and it, it sort of it highlighted to me how we live in a world of, of uh, very much sound bites. We like things quickly and succinctly, don't we? It's the, the Twitter generation, the 140 characters, and we like to get things out. And, and that seems to be the way we're getting our information these days. It is. It's, it's interesting because those um, th- those chapters are dotted throughout the the book. After each expose, there's a dip into well, how's the you know how is radio news reacting? How are newspapers reacting? How is social media reacting? Social media, I think incredibly um, interesting because it's it shifted the balance of power a lot in the way that newspapers work. So 20 years ago if you read a newspaper column and you really were angered by something that this columnist said you might write a letter, you know it might get published but um, <clears throat> You wouldn't necessarily know if you were on your own or whether other people felt as angry as you did about what had been written. Mm. Now you just go onto Twitter, there's probably a hashtag within seconds of this column going out there, and suddenly you find there's possibly tens of thousands of people who are just as angry as you, and and the newspaper columnists will become aware of that as well. So, I, I, you know, social media has very much changed the balance of power in, in this country and other countries where you have Facebook and Twitter. And we'll talk in a minute or two as well about the, the running of the newspaper itself, because, again, it's a very interesting insight into how a newspaper runs, uh, particularly the stronger relationship now that online has with the editors than it used to have. And there is a certain rivalry. And Una, one of the characters, has been brought in, and she's an enormously powerful woman because she understands how social media works. And, of course, there's many people who have been dragging their heels for so long. They don't want to be part of that, but they're kind of almost forced into it now, aren't they? They are. I mean, it's interesting. It, it's almost like the mobile phone argument from 20 years ago, the people that said, oh, I'm never getting a mobile phone. You can have that. And <laughs> of course, we've all got them now. It's very un- it's very rare to find someone who genuinely does not have a mobile phone. And I think social media is, is, is the modern equivalent of that now, that there are people saying, oh, I'll never be on Facebook. I'll never be on Twitter. Um, and actually, people I know that two years ago said they'd never be on Facebook. Facebook are on Facebook now and so on. Mm. But um, I think particularly in the media and particularly in newspapers, online there's the debate about, you know, should you have free access to these websites or should you have to pay to access the Sun website, for instance. But um, the, their online presence is incredibly important now. Mm. They make an enormous amount of money out of online, perhaps even more so than they do out of the print editions of their newspapers. So the balance of power between someone like Una Boyle, who's the um, online editor, and Leonard Twig, who's the newspaper editor, you know, there's a lot of rivalry between them throughout the book and um, and you know an, an old fashioned newspaper editor and someone who's quite up to date with modern technology it's, it's quite an interesting debate I, I love the names as well you, know, you don't forget the names do you <laughs> they're, they're almost like <laughs> Una Moyle and Twig it's just the I don't know <laughs> delighted to say that my guest this afternoon is no stranger to us here at BBC Essex he's a journalist Paul Eilert uh, whose first it's your first novel but you've written plenty haven't you which you you were telling me earlier you kind of almost finished is that about right? It's, yeah, it's ter- I've got a, a terrible history of the uh, past 20 years of sort of starting and then uh, not completing uh, books. So I, I start with the best of intentions and then, you know, life just gets in the way. And, and particularly when I was doing a lot of shift work, it just was impossible. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, with this one, I, I knew when I sort of sat down a few years ago to write it, I thought this is very much of the time that I can't start this and then put it aside for a few years. I'm either going to finish it or not bother doing it at all. So, um I managed to get into a really good routine at home with my partner and our 12-year-old, and, and that allowed me to, you know, to sit down for a good couple of hours every day yeah. for the better part of two years and, and actually just crack on with it. So, And I think that if, you're, if you are trying to do something creative, like write a book or whatever, just getting into a really good routine at home is really important to, in order to, to complete what you want to do. And what time of day do you like to write? Um, I like to write when I get home from work, so um, I'll get home maybe sort of six o'clock in the evening, uh, make a cup of tea, and particularly in the summer it's quite nice because my partner can go out and do the gardening, um, our 12-year-old can, she's, she's quite creative as well, so she can go off and, and do something, you know, she likes to write herself actually. Oh really? And, Excellent. Um, Excellent. And, uh, and then, you know, I'll have a couple of hours before dinner to, um, you know, to, to write, or maybe just an hour. Yeah. But, it, but it was every day, and that was the important point, that, that I knew that at that point I could sit down with a cup of tea and actually just, just write, which I, is a routine I really enjoyed. Yeah. And 
As we mentioned before, the book is so relevant to what's going on right now and what is unfolding, and certainly the, the situations that this tabloid newspaper, fictional tabloid newspaper, I have to say, this isn't a work of fact, although, as I did mention in my introduction, it is um, art imitating life, because it, it, it is very much of what is going on at the moment, and, and no doubt we'll be hearing more stories, which will could be actually dangerously close to what you're writing here, um, a, a celebrity getting their own back pretty much on the press. Um, one of the interesting areas I wanted to, to bring in very briefly as well is the subject of the newspaper owner, who's very much a, a major part of this book as well, and, and, and his son, who he brings in to be able to shape things up and turn things around. Um, and again, keeping it in the family was a very, <laughs> very interesting one. Because again, you know, that, that's, that, that's not hard to imagine, is it, in what's been going on in real life? No, I mean, it was, I, I wanted, um, I thought if it was um, a story about just the staff at the newspaper, again, it might be a bit sterile. I thought it was really important that at the heart of this story there was a family. So um, the story revolves around this very wealthy family called the Harveys, who um, started off by setting up the Daily Air in the, in the late 70s, and that sort of started off their fortune and their media empire um and the the son um harvey jr as he's called um is brought back from america when the, all this kicks off and it's his job to sort it out and to prove himself to his dad that he's got you know the, the capability to sort out a really big problem um but you're I, I think throughout the book you're kind of waiting for adam james who's the actor to turn his attention to this family and to see what he's got on them yeah and what's interesting already is that where I'm at at the book, and I don't want to give anything away because I, I think it's one of these books you have to just go for it, just read it as it goes, is because it is a ticking, literally a ticking time bomb. Because he, this, the actor, publishes a website which he says he's going to start publishing um, details about certain people in the newspaper. In other words, doing exactly what the newspaper's been doing. But there's a little bit more integrity the way the actor is doing it, because he's going to warn them beforehand that it's going to happen. But, of course, even though they're warned before, it's, it's actually even more cruel, because they know it's coming. And, and also, all these skeletons that are in the cupboards, everybody's worried about which one they're going to choose, yes, yes. aren't they? And, and so it's, yeah. it's actually quite a thriller in that respect, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's, uh, it's I hate to use the word mechanism, because that sounds a bit sort of clinical, really, but um, in the book, um, in Chapter 1, he reveals, the actor reveals every three days, he's going to reveal a new expose about someone at the Daily Ear, mm. and he'll ring them just beforehand. So, And that's quite important, because everyone's waiting to see if they're the one who's going to get the phone call. Um, and in the book, all the, the public get caught up in the excitement of all this. They're all very excited. Who's going to be next? What's the scandal going to be? But it actually works for readers as well. So once you've sort of read the latest expose and you've seen the fallout from that, you're kind of wondering, well, who's next and what's their story going to be? And I think that's why a lot of the people who have read the book have, have, have read it in a very short period of time because um, they've kind of... I mean, some of the... <laughs> I can't bear the three uh, days. <laughs> you know, I read it in real time. <laughs> Absolutely. But um, some of the reader reviews I've had, they've said, you know, this kept me up till two in the morning. So, yeah. And that's, from a writer's point of view, that's fantastic to think that you've really gripped a read to that extent. Great stuff. I don't want to say any more about the book and about the plot because I will end up giving something away at this point. I don't want to do that. What I do want to say is um, it is available now, isn't it? It's available now on Amazon and that's either for Kindle or as a paperback. Right. And we were just saying earlier on how much we love both of us reading a book. Proper book. There's yep. nothing quite like reading a book, is there? And just, just sort of rounding off there, you know, we we're talking about online and the future of newspapers as well. Can you see, from the way you've written and indeed the way things are going, can you see a time when there won't be newspapers, that we will actually be reading everything on some electronic device, or do you think there's always going to be a newspaper around? I, I would like to think there'll always be paper. Um, and um, I'd like to think there'll always be someone sat in a train reading a paper. Mm. I think what we might see is, is as papers go out of business, their replacements will be online news. And there's a lot of online uh, news websites which are only online and have only ever been online. So I think that's probably how things will go. But I... Um, I, th I, I don't know, maybe it's a generational thing, but I, I would hate to think that the proper books and proper newspapers won't be here one day. What would Sunday be without all the supplements thrown <laughs> exactly. out in front of you? <laughs> there you are, sat there, and it's peaceful. You, you, you've, got, you've got a child, so you don't, you, like, like I, you do not understand about peace anymore. But, you know, the idea that you can have scrambled egg, a cup of tea on the side, tight table, and newspapers leisurely through the day. 
It's a wonderful life. It is. It is great. Great to meet you today, Paul. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. And let us know what you're up to next. Are you writing your second novel now? I, I am. I'm, I'm you're just off and running now. I'm just doing all the uh, the chapter notes and the character plans and everything. So I'm um, I'm right in the middle of it, and I've learnt from the process of writing this one. So I'm going to stick with it. Great stuff. Come and see us when it's when it's done, won't you? We'll do. It's great to see you. Thanks again, Paul Islet, my special guest on the show this afternoon. Expose is available now. Oh, and quick question: Where on the keyboard is? The accent over the E. <laughs> yeah, there's a question you ask early on in the book, and I was when I was talking about it today. I thought, like, well, how do I type expose on a keyboard? Is it above the? You have to go to you have to go to insert symbol. Ah, oh, which is insert symbol. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> we should do that every day, shouldn't we? A daily tip. <laughs> Great to see you, Paul. Thanks very much indeed. It's